Good morning. Welcome to Living Way. Song number 649. Blessed be the tie that binds. 649. You know, sometimes when we sing songs in church, we just sing songs. But, you know, it's helpful at times as we sing to really think about the words that we're singing. And as we're singing this one this morning, and I chose it because in, in the book of Acts today, um, persecution hits the church. And the churches, the, the Christian people are scattered. And, and it's a tough time for the church. And, and this song talks about even though we part for a while... You know, we're still together in Christ, and we're going to all be joined together. It also has the, the, the meaning of, in earthly life, eventually we part when we pass from this life. But we're all going to join together again in heaven. So it's a beautiful hymn of the church and the, the, bind, the uh, tie that binds us together, which is Christ. Christ is the one that binds us all together. I'd like to um, make a couple announcements. First of all, a uh, big, big thank you to Pastor Bill Norton, who filled in for me the last two weeks while we were on vacation. So what a blessing. Bill, Pastor Bill, is in the evening group, so he's not even here to thank him. However, I believe they watched the video. I know they do. And so let's say, or let's give him a round of applause and thank you to Bill. <laughs> for that, that. So we appreciate you, Bill. Thank you for that work. A uh, second announcement is, in, in case you don't haven't already heard this elsewhere, this coming Sunday is uh, fall back, your clocks. So just a reminder, you get an extra hour. Um, you don't have to take an extra hour of sleep, that's fine. But um, uh, don't come an hour early to church. That's probably not going to work too well. Uh, and and when, in the springtime, I always advise do it Friday night. When you go forward... Lose the hour of sleep on Friday night, not Saturday. But this time, on Saturday night, it's fine. You know, set your clock back an hour. Great, you know, it's all, all good, all good. So let's open with prayer. Um, some of us, uh, the portals of prayer are available on the, in the uh, entryway on the narthex. And it's, you know, a daily devotion and um, a prayer book. And at the back of the book, there are some really great prayer resources. 
And there's a prayer for each day of the week, morning, evening. There's prayers for different occasions. It's, it's, a, it's a great resource. But I thought this morning, the Thursday morning prayer seemed very appropriate for Acts chapter 8 and for our situation as well. So let's, let's join in prayer for Thursday morning. Gracious Father, through Christ and his cross, you have reconciled the world to yourself. By your word and spirit, cause this redemption to be, to be made known in all the earth. Equip all pastors, teachers, deacons, deaconesses, missionaries, and lay people to be heralds of salvation. Open the ears of those who hear your word so that the saving gospel may bring them joy in the salvation Christ has won for them. Open my mouth this day to speak of Christ in the opportunities you set before me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you for the lecture at 11 o'clock. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your holy word, a word that shows us a church that was persecuted, but a church that also had purpose, a church that went forward and, and shared the gospel of Christ, a church that grew through your Holy Spirit. Bless and, bless and guide us, Lord, through your word today, that we as your church today may indeed be a church that, that reaches out, that shares the gospel, and that people would be blessed by that word. Uh, be with us now in this time of lecture. Let your Holy Spirit guide these words and, and our thoughts to your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So chapter 8 of the book of Acts, the church persecuted and scattered, and Philip's work in Samaria. So chapter 8 begins with a verse that actually kind of tacks on to chapter 7 uh, last week with the martyrdom of Stephen, uh, one of the deacons uh, who gave that beautiful uh, confession of faith and then was killed because of that confession, the first Christian martyr. And then chapter 8 begins with these words, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. And so Saul, whom later becomes Paul, the great missionary, he's right there on the scene, and he is right there with them saying, yeah, get those, get, kill those Christians, kill them. So the, the chapter 8 continues. On that day, uh, the day of Stephen's martyrdom, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. Uh, and this was the first of many, many persecutions, organized, systematic, or systemic, Systematic, actually. Um, in verse 3, we see they, they actually went house to house. You know, this is kind of like uh, sometimes in history we've seen, like in, in communist countries and, and elsewhere, where they'd go and seek out the Christians. You know, look for a place that has a cross. Not, not then, but nowadays. Look for a place that has a Bible. That kind of a thing, where people are, are sought house by house. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So first of all, just to note, the, the ones that didn't scatter were the apostles. And remember back in the, in the Gospels, uh, for example, in John chapter 20, how the apostles were so afraid they locked their doors and hid because they didn't want to be persecuted or arrested or possibly killed like Jesus had been arrested and then killed on the cross. And so they were very cowardly, fearful for their lives. But now they're bold. What's the difference? The Holy Spirit. Pentecost has happened. These are post-Pentecost apostles. And so they uh, alone are not scattered. Um, and then what's interesting, though, is where were the people scattered to? The Christians, the believers, throughout Judea and Samaria. Remember the words of Jesus. You know, I will make you my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is where they were, and to Judea and to Samaria and the ends of the earth. And so here they are going out to Judea and to Samaria, like he had said they would, uh, and now they're going to bring the message there. And eventually Paul is going to go to the ends of the earth with the message, the Apostle Paul. Um, 
Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. And that, that just reminded me of back when Jesus died on the cross, there were, quote, godly men among the leaders of the Jews, right there in the Sanhedrin, in the, the council that ruled o over all the Jews, uh, the religious council. Uh, there were Nicodemus and Joseph, who were godly men, who went after Jesus died and took his body down from the cross and went and buried him uh, in the tomb. They didn't know he was going to rise again. I'm sure they were you know, happy that he did and, and, and joyful over it. But at that point, they just, in respect for Jesus, they buried him. And so the same thing for Stephen. Some godly men took courage and mourned deeply and buried him. Uh, verse 3, but Saul began to destroy the church. Now that word destroy uh, in Greek, is a, the picture is a wild boar ravaging a vineyard, like kind of running amok, just wrecking everything. Or think of a, 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 a dead body that's scavenged by, by wild animals, um, you know, like uh, vultures, you know, it's a carcass. And the vultures like ripping it apart. That's the word about Paul or Saul wanting to rip apart, ravage the church. And, and one other just important thing I, I want to point out here is that we just, we fly over it without thinking about it. But what's he wanting to destroy? The church. What's the church? In the Bible, the church is never a building. It's always people. People. And that's something we just don't want to ever let go of. Don't want to forget. Because we tend to just use the word church to mean this. You know, I'm going to church. No, you are the church. You are the church. Um, we use it for a shorthand. We say this building. Um, in the Bible, there are places of worship. You know, the synagogue, the temple, like this place of worship. But this is not the church. The church is people. And Paul wanted to destroy and arrest people. And that's important for us to never forget uh, that the church is people. Um, I'll, I'll just, a little side thing of interest. I've always had this kind of used it from time to time in my teaching. Um, it's a Soylent Green moment. Now, any of you who don't know what Soylent Green is, um, it's a Charlton Heston movie, science fiction, but the whole gist of it is, and I'm gonna spoil it, if you've never seen it by now, it's like too late, but Soylent Green is people. That's the whole point. Now, I won't tell you well, what's the Soylent Green and all that stuff, but Soylent Green is people. Well, the church is people. The church is people, not a building. Um, so Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So here the people that were scattered away, were fled, they're sharing the word of God. And, and even uh, later on in, cha in Acts chapter 11, it still mentions, now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. That's out of, of the immediate area of Israel. Um, spreading the word only among Jews at first. Okay, so they'd go and they'd tell other Jews what they knew. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So, so it wasn't just to Judea and Samaria, which that did happen at first, but later on these scattered believers went into other places, first to Jewish people, but also then to Greek people which is Paul's method later. Paul would go first to the Jews, and then he would go to the, the Gentiles, the Greek people. So an important application at this point, we tend to see only good times or bad times. We think, okay, oh, those are good times. These are bad times. But the truth is that with God, even bad times can lead to great good. Even bad times can lead to great good. Right here, there's a bad time going on. It's persecution of the church, but God is doing good stuff. He's growing the church, the word is going out. Good things are happening in spite 
of the evil that's being done against the believers. An example, Romans 8, 28, you know, God works for good of those who believe. You know, God, in all things, God works for the good of those who, who believe in him, who trust in him. And think of the cross. You know, no more evil was done to anyone than to Jesus on the cross. Every single sin of the world was placed upon him who was innocent and sinless. And yet he took all of that bad, all of the evil was concentrated on him on that cross. And from that evil, from that bad on him is the greatest good of all. You know, we are set free from our sin. We are forgiven through his atonement. Um, God works in spite of the bad. Joseph, the story of Joseph. Again, you know, you meant evil against me. God meant it for good. And when we think of our culture, there are bad times. Lots of bad. And it seems like worse times. Things are worse and worse and bad and badder. No, it's not better. More worse. Worse. But yet in spite of it, God's still going to work. God is going to continue to find good or bring good in the midst of a broken, evil uh, world and culture. Okay, chapter 8, verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria. Okay. Uh, Philip. Philip. One of the seven, one of those guys in chapter uh, six, um, one of the deacons, not an apostle, but one of the deacons like, like Stephen. Um, and Philip went down, okay, not south. We say, like on our vacation, we went down to visit family in California. We went down to California. Or you go up to Canada, you know, north and south. But from Jerusalem, you go down. You go down from Jerusalem or you go up to Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem's on the holy hill. So you go up to Jerusalem or you go down from Jerusalem. He goes down from Jerusalem to a city in Samaria. And Samaria was that place uh, that it was a, the Samaritans were people that, you know, as you well, know, well are aware, I'm sure, that they were in conflict with Jews. They didn't like each other. The Samaritans were the people who, after the Assyrians had wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel and taken them away, and they had brought in foreigners, who then some of the remainder people who were still around intermarried and brought with them kind of some of their culture. And so that, that group of Samaritans were kind of like um, step or, or half, half, half blood, you could say. You know, part Jewish or part Israelite, but not full Israelites like the people of, of the South. And so he had this big uh, dispute constantly. Jesus traveled to Samaria. Remember the woman at the well? Um, you know, brings her living water. Um, so here, um, Philip goes to Samaria, which is a place you would think, no. But remember, Jesus said, you know, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even in that place, Samaria. And he proclaimed the Christ, you know, the Messiah there, Jesus, the Messiah. When the crowd heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits or unclean spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So he preaches Christ, People were healed. Joy is the result from that message of the gospel. And, and that's what Christianity does. It brings joy. It brought joy to the people of Samaria who were living in darkness, deep darkness. And yet the gospel brings light, the light of Christ, the light of Jesus into their lives, which brings joy, joy. And that's what the church still does today. That's the gospel. It's to bring joy to people's hearts in the midst of a, a world of darkness, and sin, the light of Christ that brings joy and healing of our sin, from our sin. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, yeah, and as above, the persecution in one city, in Jerusalem, leads to great joy in another place. And isn't that amazing? So here's persecution, which again leads to joy over here. It's, it's just God at work. God is at work. Okay, then verses 9 to 25, where we hear about Simon the sorcerer, and Peter and John arrive on the scene. Now, for some time, a man named Simon 
had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is the divine power, known as the great power. You know, like, kind of like in Wizard of Oz, the great and mighty Oz. And that's kind of like this, it's kind of a fluffy title. He's a showman. And so, but yet he's, he's, he's popular. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic, which was not that unusual in that day. We, we still have, you know, magicians, what, David Copperfield or others, or people who do these, these uh, magic things. And, you know, we know they're not magic. They're just acts. They, they, they're tricks and very well rehearsed and so forth. And, and in that culture, there were all kinds of those things, all kinds of them. Now, some of them may have been the dark arts, may have been satanic, and maybe they did have spiritual powers, evil powers, but mostly also, they were often the same as today, just fakes, charlatans, who put on a show and did a good job at it. I mean, people are people, and people are gullible. And, and so, um, anyways, for whatever reason, though, um, here's this magician, he was popular. And then verse 12, but when they believed Philip, the people there in Samaria, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now this was astonishing news for the Jews. It's like, Samaritans can believe? How can that be? How could a Samaritan? I mean, they're dogs. They're dogs. They may be human in form, but they're dogs. We know that. It's like, and, in, and that's why in verse 14, when the apostles heard, that Samaria had accepted the word, they sent Peter and John. It's like, whoa, you know, this is amazing that Samaritans can believe. So we're, we, they've stepped outside of just Jewish people now to the Samaritans, to non-Jewish or part Jewish people. Um, <clears throat> Simon, verse 13, Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Now, I'm not going to, look at his heart and try to determine whether he fully believed or didn't or what was going on in there. But we do see there's some troubling signs. You know, he's, he had this need for great power and he wanted the recognition. You know, he had a big ego, you might say. And then when he becomes a, a believer, it sounds like a believer, he's baptized, he says he believed, but he still has this problem of his wanting ego power and so forth, which is going to manifests itself uh, in just a moment. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Um, I, I like to call it the big guns are brought in. It's like, whoa, the mission field has opened up. Not that Philip is like somehow less than, a, a, you know, he's an evangelist and he did good work and that's true. But it's like, this is unexpected. A whole new mission field has opened in Samaria. Let's send down the big guns, you know, Peter and, and John. They're, they're the, kind of the, the big leaders, you know. And so they go down there and partly to validate it, to say, yeah, this is real. This is true. This isn't some little offspring. This is real believers in Christ. This is the church. And they, they affirm it. They, they come down and they, they kind of witness to it and, and uh, give... give uh, What's the word? Imprimatur. I mean, they say, yes, this is, this is real. Although there's kind of this weird part here in verse 15. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Now that is kind of, whoa, what's that? You know, we, the, we always, we've talked about this many times. Baptism and Holy Spirit go together. You can't say, well, you have baptism and you have a Holy Spirit and then somehow you sometimes do this, sometimes you do that, sometimes you put them together. It's like, no, they all connect. In fact, we already know, like before Pentecost, we, we talked about this when we talked about the Pentecost. Before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was still already with the apostles, in the apostles. They're in the, uh, in the uh, upper room when Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, they could not believe without the Holy Spirit, as Paul says. No one can confess Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. So what's the difference here? It's that Pentecost way of the Spirit, where God came in a miraculous way to empower and explode the church. You know, explode outwardly, not 
boom, blow up, explode outwardly and empower it in a, in a special way. And in that way, the Pentecost way had not yet come, had not fallen upon them. You know, their, their baptism was still baptism. They believed, they believed, they could not believe without the Holy Spirit, but now in a special way, the, the apostles are going to share the Pentecost experience to empower this mission field, so to speak. So then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit um, in, in that Pentecost way. It's not like, oh, they never had the Holy Spirit, now they have, the, no. Again, they could not be believers without the Holy Spirit. But this is empowering them in this Pentecost way, uh, that, such as on the day of Pentecost. And, and this, the thought there is, you know, touch a Samaritan, yuck. You know, you don't touch people like that because they were seen as unclean to Jews. But, but this is a new, a new thing. You know, this is a new creation. This is, this is Christ. Christ would definitely he, touch a Samaritan. And they touch, they lay their hands on them, um, and they receive the Holy Spirit. It's also a way of saying, okay, we had the Pentecost in Jerusalem, and now you guys are receiving that special power of the Spirit here, and it's like we're one church. We're not, oh, we're the better church, and you guys are just the little, like, off, little sidebar church that's kind of like, eh. No, they're saying this is the church too. Not just Jerusalem, but here is the church. And it's a, a uniting of the church. And that's the application I want to point to right now. Um, and when I say applications, when I put these in, there are many applications. These are just ones that came to me that I want to share with you uh, as we go through the scripture. Um, God confronts our natural tendency to divide ourselves. That's what we do. We divide. You look at our age. Oh, age division. You know, a male-female division. Uh, young, uh, uh, rich, poor division, uh, color, skin division. You know, we could just divide ourselves, you know, in many, many ways. You know, California versus Washingtonian divisions. Uh, it could go on. So um, we divide ourselves. And ultimately, the scripture talks about, you know, who divides? Satan. You know, the Bible talks about the wall, uh, that he divides us with a wall of hostility. Like, that's the problem. In marriage, Satan wants to divide us. You know, father and mother and children, divide. You know, um, neighbor, divide. That's the Satan's work is to divide. And in our sinful nature, we want to divide. Divide ourselves all up. And God confronts our natural tendency, natural sinful tendency, to divide ourselves by showing them and us that there are not two churches. There's not a Jewish church and a Samaritan church, but one church, one. Um, Ephesians chapter four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Okay, so this is, this is not just for them to think of, but us as well. There is one church, one body of Christ, not a bunch of different little churches and so forth. Verse 18, when Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now at that point, now I am being a little judgmental, I guess, but I'm picturing He's not saying it with sincere, oh, I want other people to become believers and I want them to have this great experience. No, he's thinking about himself, that he wants that power, that he can go around, zap, you know, look at me, zap. And I've got, you know, make a name for himself, the big ego, Simon, who's so, you know, the great power, they called him. And now I've got this great power, zap with the spirit, zap with the spirit. And, and now I, I'm judging but that's what it sounds like to me as I read that. Um, and especially, I also, I have some evidence why that may be so. The reaction of, of, uh, of uh, Peter, what he says to him, it makes it pretty clear that Simon is not in the right frame of mind as a believer. Now, at this point, he says, he, he offers them money. Um, and that practice is something that, that went on throughout the Middle Ages. And it was one of the Reformation things that, that 
just out of the many things that the Reformation kind of took aim at, this is one of them, buying and selling ecclesiastical, I mean churchly, offices, positions. So like for me to become the pastor here, um, I would like pay the bishop a certain amount of money. You know, like, oh, or, or my son. I want my son to be the, the priest or the bishop of, of Port Angeles. And so I will, I'm rich, so I'll pay a bunch of money to the archbishop and then he'll appoint my son as the, you know, and a lot of these guys in these church positions, they weren't even, you know, churchly people. You know, they just, they were positions of power and they called that simony. Where did they get the word? From this. This is where they get the word from. Simony, it's, it's when you buy or sell ecclesiastical offices. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's go on to verse 20. Now we get Peter's response. Peter answered, good idea, Simon. We'll give it to you. No, he said, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Okay, this is, again, the Holy Spirit is a gift that's given, not something you purchase. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Oh, I guess maybe my little, my little judge, judging of Simon wasn't off when Peter says your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. Okay? So he gives him a way out. He says, turn from your sin, repent, go back to God and, and, and ask God's forgiveness. But Simon doesn't do that. He answers, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me, which isn't necessarily bad. He's asking someone to pray for you is not a bad thing, but it indicates he is not willing to go to the Lord in prayer himself, which is what he needs. He needs to go to the Lord in prayer for his own sin. And it also recalls to me the case in uh, Exodus with Pharaoh and Moses. And Moses, you know, when the plagues are coming, and there's a spot in there when the plagues are happening, and Pharaoh says to Moses, pray to the Lord for me. Now, did Pharaoh have a believing heart? No. He just wanted the plagues to go away. He wanted this stuff to be gone. And he thought, well, Moses has the power Pray to God to take it away, you know, pray for me. And, and then we know that Mo Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. So this isn't, it could be that Simon still had faith and he's asking them to pray for him, which is fine. But it also might be an indicator that he is, again, not a person at this point. He, he's like hardening his heart against God as, as Pharaoh did. And it's just, it's interesting to know, we don't know, he's never mentioned again in the Bible. So we don't know whether he repented or he hardened his heart. But second century writers, um, that's in the 100s, you know, 120, 150, you know, the, the early church fathers, they're called, referred to Simon as the father of all heresies. So that's just as history, he kind of seen that way. The Gnostic heresies, where they blended things into Christianity from outside of Christianity and outside of Judaism, um, they would, uh, uh, anyways, the father of all Gnostic heresies. When they had testified to proclaim the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So the word has now gone out. Because of the persecution in Jerusalem, people are now believing in Samaria. That's amazing, amazing. Last part, and it's on the back side of your handout, I believe. Um, <clears throat> Philip and the Ethiopian. And this is a bonus week, by the way. There are two pictures, <laughs> two pictures. Not just on the front, but front and back. That's the first time I think in all the years of Living Way we've ever had two pictures in one lesson. So I think you'll hopefully give me an extra couple minutes here because of that. Um, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Caught that? Gaza. Have you heard of Gaza lately in the news? I mean, really, seriously, this is, that, this is that area, you know? And the gospel is being brought to people there, just as people need it now there as well. Um, so the, uh, to Gaza. So he started out, this is Philip again, and on his way he met an Ethiopian, um, Ethiopian eunuch. Now, the Ethiopian here is referring to, he's an African, he's black. 
Um, not the country of Ethiopia, which didn't exist then. He would be from Nubia, which is south of Egypt, which uh, Nubia is present day Sudan. And in case you didn't know it, there are more pyramids in Sudan than there are in Egypt. Just a little trivia, more pyramids in Sudan than there are in Egypt. So that's how close the cultures are. But, um, and, and he was a eunuch and important official in charge of the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Candace was a title, like president or like Pharaoh. It's another name. Um, this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So he was a God-fearer, we would say. Someone who believed in the God of Israel, the God of the Jews. Now, um, you could say he was a proselyte. Proselyte means you become one of them, like someone who's not a Jew, and you become a Jew by going through certain things. But one thing, technically, he couldn't be a proselyte because he was a eunuch, which means he was castrated. He could not be circumcised. So, as a, so that, in a sense, he was then probably a God-fearer more than a, a proselyte. But either way, he believed in the God of Jerusalem. And he was wealthy enough to have a scroll, which in those days, you don't just care. Nobody had books. He didn't have books. He didn't carry on books or libraries. or scrolls. It was too expensive. He had a scroll of the book of Isaiah. Um, he's reading. He's sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah. Um, and Isaiah sometimes is called the evangelist of the Old Testament. You know, uh, the, the New Testament evangelists, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Isaiah is like the Old Testament evangelist. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Philip ran up the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And then there we have the scripture. Um, and, and the man, and Philip says, do you understand it? And he says, how can I understand it? Unless someone tells me what it means. And so then he reads uh, from the scripture, from Isaiah 53, the familiar passage of the, the uh, suffering the suffering servant um, who's led like a sheep to the slaughter and it's talking about Jesus. The exact thing that Philip was probably eager to tell him about, here it was. You know, God opened this up just at this moment. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? You know, this is God's timing. The right place, the right time, and God leads Philip right there at that moment when this guy needs to hear it. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture, told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Shouldn't I be baptized? Again, it's a God thing, the timing. Hey, here's some water. And he gave um, orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Some would look at that as like, like, bing, he's gone. Or just, he's, the Spirit said, hey, Philip, come on, we're going this way. Um, it, it could be either way. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus. Again, some would say, he's like, bing, like, kind of like uh, in Star Trek, you you know, beam out, or beam down, or beam whatever. So you, you disappear in one spot, you reappear here. I, I personally just take, tend, to, tend to look at it as the Spirit led him away, and then now he's appearing in this other place. But it, it isn't that he couldn't do it, but that's not the, normally how things operate in the Scripture, where people buzz in and out like that. But whatever. <laughs> Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So um, the word preaching, has, it's a Greek word, kerygma, and it can also mean proclaiming. And I like proclaiming as a translation because as Christians, guess what? You get to proclaim. Because you think, well, I'm not a preacher. I don't want to preach to my neighbor. I don't want to preach at people. No, you don't want to preach at them, but you proclaim. You share the good news. And that the Greek word means preach or proclaim. Um, and, and, then, and then Philip disappears in the book of Acts until Acts 21. When the, when the apostles, the, the missionaries come to Caesarea and there he is and his four daughters and we'll save that story for when we get to chapter 21. So make sure you keep coming back. Um, and then the, an application to make here, we cannot make the timing right for others to believe. We can't do that. We can't force people to believe. Um, we, we can't make the timing right, but we can prepare ourselves to be ready for that moment, God gives the timing. Our role is to be ready, to be ready to share the love of Jesus. The peace of Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you.